Good morning. Before to start, I want to share the great experience that my wife and I, we had in San Luis this week. My wife starts the new academic year in the seminary as a deaconess. It's gonna be four years, so we excited and we want to thank everyone to, for prayers and for the support. And we thank you for safe travels. You went there and came back all in one piece. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Again, good morning to everyone, especially those who are worshiping with us online. We're glad that you're with us today. As uh, I got a couple of announcements to share with you. Of course, if you looked in your bulletin this morning, we have a few inserts. There is an update from the call committee, also the building expansion and technology. Uh, at the end of the service, uh, Sue Tumlin will speak to the update on our call committee, our senior pastor call committee. So we'll look forward to that. Let's just take a minute and greet those who are worshiping around you this morning. Let's begin with our opening hymn.
Christ. And we begin this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I say, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I am poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, which means I have ever offended you, and justice deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am very sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you and your bounties to mercy. And for the sake of the holy, innocence, your sufferings, and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful me. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the world, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by co the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But we, bl we will bless the Lord from this time, for and forevermore. Praise the Lord. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord say to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Praise the Lord, all nations. Exalt him, all people. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. be to God on high. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom to know in everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Through his name, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who live and reign with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
please be seated. The first reading for this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look for, to the rock for which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I may bless him in, and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they, they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading for this morning is taken from Romans chapter 11. All the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, that the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we may we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, through many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them in prophecy, in proportion to our faith, in service, in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaches, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is written in the 16th chapter of St. Matthew, beginning at the 13th verse. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. 
He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of our Lord. join together and profess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Please be seated.
grace, mercy, and peace be unto each and every one of you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of scripture upon which our message this morning is based comes to us from our gospel lesson, which was shared just a few minutes ago. Now, I know I'm dating myself here, but during the 1980 Winter Olympics, an American skater from Madison, Wisconsin, named Eric Hyden, took all five gold medals in men's speed skating. In the first four events, he set all new Olympic speed records. In the final event, the 10,000 meter race, Hayden not only broke the record, but he also set an all-time new world speed record of 14 minutes and 28 seconds. 10,000 meters is over six miles. Isn't that remarkable? And as amazing as all those victories were, those victories came as no surprise to those who had followed Eric Hyden through the years. Hyden had, been, Hyden had been winning every time he competed in an amateur race. He was recognized as the world's greatest speed skater who had ever lived. Sports writers knew it. Coaches knew it. Even Hyden's competitors knew it. The plain and simple fact at the time was that no one could equal Eric Hyden when it came to speed skating. But now you would naturally think that having that kind of knowledge would demoralize and deflate people who had to compete against Hyden. After all, what's the point of even entering the race if you already know in advance that there's no chance whatsoever of ever equaling the champion? That, in fact, could be downright depressing. As it turned out, just the opposite is true. Other skaters clamored to compete with Hyden. Even though they knew they could not beat him, they knew that skating against him would bring out the best in them. For example, when Hyden won the 500-meter race, second place went to a Russian skater who turned in his personal best time ever. When Hyden raced in the 100 meter, the runner-up was a Canadian skater who clocked his personal fastest time ever. And so it continued for every race. The silver and the bronze medalists in the Olympics who lost to Hyden actually achieved greater personal speeds than ever before, simply because they were doing their best to equal Eric Hyden. Now, this phenomenon, it became known as the Haydn effect. Today, that is now defined as achieving new personal victories by striving to equal a competitor one knows he can never equal or surpass. Now, if that really works, I would love to play a few rounds of golf with Tiger Woods. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. But I mention that today because the Haydn effect, the Haydn effect sounds something like our relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We know that we can never even come close to being Jesus' equal. We know that we are sinful human beings. We are sinners. And Jesus is sinless. He's perfect, but I believe, I think that by believing in Jesus as our Lord and Savior and following his will for our lives makes us better people. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus and his disciples were in the region of Caesarea Philippi, and there were numerous heathen temples there dedicated to many false gods, and it was against that backdrop that Jesus then looked at his disciples and he asked them the most famous question of all time, who do people say that I am? And the disciples reported, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or some other prophet. But then Jesus got downright personal and said, but who do you say that I am? And you see, that's an important and an eternal question that we each have 
to answer. Who do we say Jesus is to us? It's a question that has been asked thousands of times down through the centuries, and yet it still must be confronted. You see, there are many people who really aren't sure what they believe about Jesus. They may refer to him as their Lord or their Master, but they're not quite sure what those titles infer. For example, does Jesus really take an interest in our own individual lives? Have you ever wondered that yourself? Does he care about what we have to go through some days? Can he actually help us with the problems that we face day in and day out? I heard this story about this one woman who, while at work, she received a phone call from her babysitter telling her that her young daughter was very sick with a fever. The woman immediately left work. She stopped at a drugstore to pick up some medication for her daughter. When she went out to the car, she realized that she had locked her keys in the car. She started sobbing. She didn't know what to do. She called the babysitter to tell her what had happened. The babysitter told her, you know, your daughter is getting worse. The fever is spiking. And so she became even more concerned. And then the babysitter suggested, why don't you try and find an old coat hanger and see if you can unlock your car. And so she did. She looked around in the parking lot for a minute or so, and she did. She found an old rusty coat hanger, probably left there by someone else who had locked their keys in the car. And she looked at that hanger and she said, I don't know what to do with this. And so she bowed her head and she fervently prayed, Lord, please send me some help. And within five minutes, this old rusty car pulled up next to her. She looked inside and there was a rough, gruffy looking old man with a beard. He had a biker skull cap on his head. And she thought to herself, my God, this is the help you send? <laughs> but the man got out of the car and said, ma'am, can I help you? Yes, she said desperately. She said, I was at work and I got a call that my young daughter was sick at home. I stopped here at the drugstore to get some medicine for her. And when I came out, I realized I locked my keys in the car. Can you unlock my car with this coat hanger? Yes, he said. And within a minute, the door was opened. She couldn't believe it. And she went over and she hugged him and she said, Oh, thank you so very much. You are such a nice man. The man looked at her and he said, No, ma'am. I'm not a nice man. Fact is, I just got out of prison. I just got out of prison for car theft, he said. <laughs> and she began to cry again. And then she hugged him. And then she prayed, Thank you, Lord, for sending me a professional. See, I believe that one way that God provides for our needs in life is by sending angels, sending angels into our lives. No, not necessarily the mystic beings that appear and then can mysteriously and miraculously disappear. I'm talking about our own family, our friends, maybe our neighbors, even our co-workers, maybe even a complete stranger as that lady experienced with the coat hanger. God uses people in our lives many times to meet our needs. And sometimes, unfortunately, we can thwart God's desires to help us because we isolate ourselves from other people. Or we try to do it on our own. I can handle this, we say to ourselves. And then there are some times that God needs us to be an angel to someone else in our life or our circle of friends. And of course, if an angel doesn't extend a helping hand, we know and believe that God is still always present with us. So in our gospel reading this morning, the disciples, they listed four possible uh, answers of who people uh, they thought Jesus is. But then again, Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, the self-appointed spokesperson for the entire group, 
He gave a wonderful testimony of faith. He told Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that was the answer that Jesus definitely wanted to hear, for he is the son of God. He is true God in the person of Jesus Christ so that he could be our savior. That name, Jesus, it means the Lord is salvation or simply savior. The word Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah, which means the anointed one. And Jesus was anointed or set apart by the Holy Spirit to be God's instrument to save us, to save you, to save me, to save all who look to him in faith. And in response to Peter's bold confession of faith, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And here Jesus is doing a little play on words because that word for Peter in the Greek New Testament is petros. It's a masculine word. And the Greek word for rock in the Greek New Testament is petra. It's a feminine word. And so here Jesus is saying he's going to build his church not upon Peter, the man, but upon his confession of faith. That's going to be the rock. In other words, Jesus is going to build his church on the forgiveness of sins, which he himself earned through his own life, death, and resurrection. And throughout the New Testament, the Greek word for church is ekklesia. It's used to define people who have been called out to faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. One of our favorite hymns is, you know, uh, the church is one foundation. And it says that Jesus Christ, the Lord, the church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so the question, who do we say Jesus is? It's a faith question. Do we believe that Jesus truly does care for us? The Bible tells us that we can cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. Do we believe that he is able to help us in times of distress beyond a shadow of a doubt? In fact, we know and believe that Christ will be with us whatever life or death brings. He has made an eternal investment in each and every one of us. And he's promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so as it was with Peter, it is also with us. It's our faith in Jesus and all that he has done for us and for our salvation that where successful living begins, where we are able to walk confidently because we know by faith who Jesus is and we trust him without reservation. Peter confessed, you are the Christ. Jesus, what a beautiful name it is. To him be the glory. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now rise and sing our offertory.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we are reminded of the treasure we have in the message of the good news of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for our gift of salvation, which we receive by faith. You are the Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Jesus, you're also our great physician. And so this morning we pray for all our friends and members who we are privately naming in our hearts before you. We especially pray for successful pancreatic cancer treatment for David Leathers, and we also give you praise and thanks for the birth of Malia Lopez to Reynolds and Lauren. We also lift up to you for peace and comfort the family of Jean Dune and Marcia Dune's uncle, also the family of Cindy Nolinger, Marcia's aunt. We thank you, Lord, for your victory over death and the grave. And may your promise of eternal life be a true source of comfort and strength for all who grieve. We also continue to lift up to you our senior pastor calling committee. We pray your guidance and blessings upon their work as we seek a new candidate to extend a call. We also pray for your guidance and diligence upon our future building and technology plans. We give you praise and thanks, Lord, for the safe travels of Pastor Miguel and Catherine this past week as they have now returned from their time in St. Louis. Continue to prosper the work of all our missionaries, both here and abroad. Keep safe all our military men and women and help each of us to share your love and forgiveness with those in our own circle of friends. We pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let us rise and pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our service continues with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. With thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who ascended above the heavens and sitting at your right hand, poured out on us this day the promised Holy Spirit on his chosen disciples. For all this the whole earth rejoices with exceeding joy. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my true body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this also in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. You may be seated at this time. I invite Sue Tumlin to share a few things with you about our call committee. Good morning. I just wanted to share a few uh, notes. Uh, first of all, uh, there's an insert in your bulletin, many today, but the one that I would like you to turn your attention to is from the call committee. Um, take a look at this today when you have time. Uh, we have finished conducting some Zoom interviews uh, with four pastors over the last two weeks, and we've narrowed it down to two. And interestingly enough, uh, the two that we are interested in having a Zoom town hall with are ones that uh, one was recommended by someone in the congregation and one was recommended by another pastor in our circuit. So these two uh, pastors, we want you to Google their website, their church website, watch their sermons, uh, write down your questions. The call committee will be available for any questions you may have after church, uh, all services the next two Sundays. And then uh, we're hoping to interview these two uh, with a town hall type of uh, format uh, where everyone would be welcome to come and listen to the um, interaction of questions. Um, and most importantly, we need to keep praying for patience and faith that God has the right person in mind for our church and for our school. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. As a reminder of why we exist as a church, let us speak together our vision statement. Through word and sacrament ministry, we share the love, joy, and peace of Jesus Christ among ourselves and with those around us. Our worship has ended. Our service now begins. Let us go in peace and... <laughs>